Before we get started, if you can please subscribe to my channel, it would really mean a lot to me. It only takes a second and you could always change your mind later on. Greetings, future corpses, and welcome to the gothic side of life. I am your funeral guide, Glenn Lee Allen Davis. So this is my celebrity suicide tier list. Now, before the naysayers start in with their little petty bullshit, you can't talk about suicide. That's wrong. You can't do that. That's not PC. You're going to hurt somebody. Yeah, fuck off. Let me tell you this, okay? Suicide is a subject that we should talk about more. And yes, sometimes in a joking manner. Because the more you discuss a subject, even if it's uncomfortable, the more you become familiar with that subject, you can identify issues in other people when they arise. I'm not here to glorify suicide. Rather, I am here to bring attention to it and celebrate those people who have passed by such horrible tragedy. And also, if at any time you have a memory about someone I mentioned, like where you were when it happened or how it made you feel, please, by all means, let me know. Put it in the comments section. That way we can create a collective discussion about the subject. So welcome to my celebrity suicide tier list. Okay, so the first celebrity on my list, of course, can be none other than Kurt Cobain. On April 5th, 1994, Kurt Cobain shot himself in the head, left a suicide note. He was only 27 years old. Of course, the lead singer and guitarist of Nirvana. The strange thing about this was he did leave a note, but for some reason, it was such a shock to everybody, nobody believed it. So shortly after, there were all these conspiracy theories that uh, uh, Courtney Love hired somebody to kill him. Uh, some guy from a punk band, some idiot, like that guy, El Duche, I think his name was. Like in, like that guy could pull it off. I've seen that guy in the clubs. I've seen him live on stage. He's a fucking drunken idiot. So there's no possible way that guy could have killed Kurt Cobain. Now, clearly he was going through a very painful moment in his life. Clearly it's something he had struggled with for a very long time. And that's what you usually find with most suicide victims is if you look at their backstory, if you look at the surrounding circumstances, you will see that it was there. Just nobody picked up on the signs. And that's what bugged me about this suicide more than anything else is the reaction from people, his fans, and the reaction from the media. MTV was nauseating. It was just I just remember Kurt Loder and his dumbass talking with psychologists and psychiatrists and trying to explain Kurt's state of mind and his lyrics. And they were, oh, his lyrics were basically suicide notes. And they're all, and they're like acting like, oh, they knew that this was going to happen. It's like, shut the fuck up, man. So yes, Kurt Cobain. But what tier do we add him to? I think with Kurt, I think he's going to go in the tragic category. Obviously, it was very tragic that that happened. That was a horrible thing. So next on our list... You can't have a suicide list without this person. That's for sure. We're talking, of course, about Mr. Roz Williams of Christian Death. Now with him, it was on April 1st, 1998. Roz hung himself in his, I think it was in the closet of his apartment. Uh, he was 34 years old. Because it was on April Fool's Day, everyone kind of thought it was a joke. Nobody took it seriously. And then soon after, it kind of sunk in and everybody was like, oh shit, he, he actually did it. Now, if you know anything about Roz Williams, you know he was obsessed with the number 1334. Now, he was 34 years old. If only he had done it on Friday the 13th, I think that would have gone down as like the ultimate fuck you to all to being in control of his own life and, and choosing his own destiny. Now, with Roz Williams, I was in Hollywood at the time. You know, we were definitely shocked about it, but not really surprised. You know, we weren't, we weren't exactly going, Oh yeah. We, you know, like, Oh, that threw us, you know, it was Roz Williams. You kind of knew if you were in the scene, you kind of knew he was a drug addict. You kind of knew that he was depressed. You kind of knew all the stuff that went with it. So with Roz Williams, let's see here, you know, what tier should he go in? I think he would go into expected. 
So Roz, I love Roz. He's the best. Our next one, we have to keep in the Williams theme here. Roz Williams, and now let's go to Robin Williams. So in August 2014, at the age of 63, Williams committed suicide in his home in Paradise K, California. Now, if I remember correctly, this was kind of a weird suicide. He did a weird strangulation thing. Like he went out of his way to strangle himself. But later it was found out that he was struggling with Lou body disease, which kind of makes you go crazy and you, you kind of don't know what's going on and they didn't catch it. It's weird when you lose somebody like that, that you grow up with, because with Robin Williams, you know, there isn't anybody on this planet that didn't see one of his movies or see him in a TV show or a comedy act. I mean, he's, he was everywhere over the last 30 years, you know, 30, 40 years. So he meant a lot to a lot of people. It's one of those cases where you have this fictitious relationship with somebody because you see them all the time on TV. You know, I grew up with Mork and Mindy. My grandmother and I used to watch it uh, all the time when I was a kid. Uh, he was a great actor. I thought he was a great actor in that movie. I thought he was a great actor in pretty much every movie he's done. So I think with, what are we doing here? With Robin Williams, I think we're going to put Robin Williams in the tragedy section. He deserves to be next to Kurt Cobain. Our next one is going to be Chris Cornell. Now, anyone who's followed Chris Cornell over the years, you know that he did struggle with depression. He was kind of open about it, uh, especially when he was on the Howard Stern show. I loved his interviews on there. Of course, I loved his voice. He was found dead in a Detroit hotel room in the early hours of May 18th in 2017. It was after one of the uh, concerts uh, with Soundgarden. Again, another hanging. Uh, definitely Soundgarden was a big influence on me. I loved their music in high school. It was very sad. You know somebody like that is so fucking talented. You know somebody like that has so much to give the world, but they can't see how much they're giving the world because of whatever whatever shit they're going through, whatever uh, uh, poor thing that they're doing, they're struggling with, they can't see how much contribution they give to society. And that's a shame. No matter how many fans told them how much they loved them, you could have a million people tell you how great you are, but some people focus on just that one person that's a dick. It's really a shame. There's always got to be some dick out there, you know? That's the driving force behind a lot of people's uh, uh, suicide and depression because I've been there, you know? you All these people say what great things you do or how wonderful you are, but you focus on that one fuckhead, that one asshole that just fucking drives you crazy with that one comment like, oh, you're boring or... Your, your music sucks or that, you know, and it just fucking drives you nuts because you're producing something and you want everyone to like it. It's easy to say, hey, I don't give a shit what people think. And usually I'm pretty good at that myself, but it's hard when you're putting yourself out there. It's one of the hardest things to do. And that's why artists suffer so much. So as my grandmother always used to say to me, if you don't have anything nice to say, shut your fucking mouth or I'm going to poke your fucking eyeballs out. My grandma was a badass, by the way. So Chris Cornell, definitely tragic. I think he would go into that category. He could still be performing some really great music. So next up is Ian Curtis. Now, Ian Curtis is obviously from Joy Division, if you guys don't know. Another May 1, in 1980, Ian Curtis, he hung himself in his Cheshire kitchen. Uh, he was only 23 years old. By the way, this was the same instance as Chris Cornell, even though it was back in 1980, they believe that his suicide was caused by the side effects of the medication that he took. So that's a horrible thing too about suicide is that you suffer from depression and these people create these cocktails of drugs for you to take to make you better. But in some instances, it makes you worse. It, it actually causes the suicide. And that's the same thing that happened with Chris Cornell, that, uh, that the drugs itself caused him to reach the brink because when you're taking a weird substance, you know, it could fuck with your head, man. It could fuck with you and you don't know what the hell's going on. I think with suicide, a lot of people are trying to test the limits of their own bodies and test the limits of their mind. And a lot of suicides are probably accidental. They were, they were just kind of pushing themselves in that direction, but they really couldn't, they don't really want to die. They just want to see how far they can take their own 
obsession or, or, or compulsion. Again, Ian, there was no emotional attachment for me because he was already dead when I started listening to his music. But definitely, I think he would be under the tragic category. All right, so maybe this next one, a lot of you might not know who he is. Uh, he was the guitarist for Fintroll. Uh, his name was Timu, and he died on Sunday morning, March 16th, 2003. And they said it was from an alcohol-related fall. He fell from a bridge. He was only 25 years old, but it later turned out that it was suicide. The odd thing is, is with him, is that I was actually in Finland at the time. My girlfriend at the time, she dated Timu previously. And when I say dated, I say eh, probably slutted around. She was she probably partied too much and she hung around with them a lot. And so they ended up together quite a few nights here and there. So uh, <laughs> she, that's one of the reasons she got the call first from her friends that this had happened. So what was told to her at the time he said he, he was drunk. He said he didn't want to live anymore. And then I guess as he was on the bridge, like kind of being dramatic, I guess you could say, somebody tried to reach for him and he uh, uh, kind of pulled away and then he fell. And that's when we were both like, oh, well, then, you know, probably not really suicide. It's probably just him uh, being dramatic. And it was an accident. Uh, like I said, some people want to push the limits of who they are and what their mindset is, and you end up doing something stupid. But as the story goes later on, one of his other bandmates came out and said, no, this was a suicide. I was there. He talked about suicide all the time. And even when the toxicology report came back, it turned out he only had three beers in his system. Now, let me tell you something. Three beers in Finland is like the equivalent of just licking the water off the sidewalk. There's there's no way the guy was fucking drunk on three beers. No fucking way. Unless they lied on that too to cover it up. But the guy said, no, he was there. He said he wanted to kill himself. Nobody stopped him. And he jumped from uh, the bridge. And that he was kind of lived the rock star lifestyle where he constantly... And uh, my girlfriend at the time told me the same thing that, you know, she felt very bad, but he was like a total party guy. And all he wanted to do was party, party, party. And he didn't really care about his, he didn't give much thought to his life. But what surprised me the most is the next day we went to the bridge where it happened. It was kind of cool at the, you know, me thinking at the time, oh, cool. I could still see blood all over the, over the ice. What surprised me the most is the memorial they had at the bridge. In America, you know, if this guy had died, they would have been just like, okay, whatever. We'll put like a cross out and we'll put some flowers down. No big deal. But I'm telling you, on this bridge, it was as if fucking Michael Jackson died. I mean, there were these little memorial bags with like candles in them and they were covered the whole bridge. I mean, there were so many, there had to be thousands of them. There were so many of them. I, I thought he was fucking the king of England or something. It was just like crazy. So with Timu, I think we are going to put him under expected. Because even though they tried to say it wasn't suicide, but later on you found out that everybody pretty much expected it because he did. He was kind of reckless with his life and he was kind of reckless. He was kind of open about wanting to die all the time. That leads us to our next one which is of course dead from Mayhem. Now the OG Norwegian black metal band Mayhem, uh, the original singer dead, he committed suicide at the age of 22 in April, 1991. Now the reason this is so significant, this suicide is, let me explain it like this. Obviously this guy was a pretty, it's pretty much expected that he was gonna commit suicide because he even asked his friends to kill him from, from what I read. Now, this guy really fucking wanted to die because what he did is he slit each of his wrists. Then he slit his throat. And when that didn't kill him, he wanted to die even sooner. He grabbed a shotgun and blew his head off. That's true black metal. True black metal. But when his guitar player, Euronymous, who would die later on, got home and saw him, did he call the cops? Did he call an ambulance? No. What he did is he rearranged his body and took pictures of it and used it as the cover of their live album, The Dawn of the Black Hearts. Uh, so definitely with Dead, we're going to put him under gruesome. And now we're on to our next one, Yukio 
Mishima. Now this is, you probably don't, haven't heard of him. He was a, a famous poet and writer in Japan. On November 25th, 1970, he killed himself. But the way he did it was unique. Not unique to Japan's uh, uh, sake. Well, I guess it was for the being in the 1970s because he, what he did is he performed seppuku. And seppuku is a tradition of samurais where they take a sword, their short sword, cut open their guts, let their guts fall out, and then somebody chops their head off. He was a great poet. He was a great uh, uh, a writer. He, from what I understand, he wanted to overthrow the government. He went to the military to try to get them on his side, but they kind of laughed at him and made fun of him and said, no, we're not going to do that. And I guess he was offended by that. So then, or shamed by that, I should say. He was shamed. So he went in back into the room and he was with four other people that were supposed to do it with him. And he performed the ritual. And then here's where it gets even weirder is when you perform seppuku, when you do that, you have to have uh, basically a person to help you cut your head off so that way you don't suffer. And the person that was assigned to cut his head off couldn't do it. It took him three tries and he kept whacking him. And I guess it, maybe he was nervous or he couldn't, you know, it, I mean, this was probably his friend. So it was a hard thing to actually see once you're doing it to chop somebody's head off. So after three whacks, somebody else stepped in. So I thought that was very interesting, a very interesting suicide. Definitely with Yukio, he will definitely be under the gruesome section. No doubt about that, because there's no other place for that one. <laughs> so next on our list is Dana Michelle Plato. She was the sister on Different Strokes, okay? On May 8th, 1999, again, another goddamn... What is it with fucking May and ropes? People love hanging themselves, and they love the month of May to kill themselves. She was 34 years old. Uh, she was on Different Strokes. I grew up watching her. Now, with her, it was by overdose. They thought it was accidental overdose, a painkiller and Valium, because she was a drug addict. She did have a history uh, doing that. But they found out that it was well over the amount that somebody should take. So clearly it was a suicide. And with this, it's kind of sad. You know, when I heard about it, I was like, oh, OK, that's sad. But, you know, who was that again? Oh, different strokes. OK, yeah, I remember her. You know, so definitely with Dana, we are going to have to put her under the the no one cares category. That's that's the saddest of all is the no one cares cat, which brings me to the next one, which is Savannah. Now, I don't know if anybody remembered Savannah. I do remember this one. This happened in July 11th in 1994. And Savannah, if you didn't know, she was a porn star. She was a pretty famous porn star, but not really famous in the sense that everybody knew about her until her suicide. And I guess what happened was is she got in a car accident after partying and stuff like that. And she basically smashed her face up. And when she went home, apparently she asked her friend to walk her dog. And then I think maybe she realized her face, she would never be able to work again with her face like that. And she got depressed and, and then shot herself in the head. The worst part about this one, though, is realistically no one kind of cared. But the only reason they did care is because she was a porn star. And that, to me, kind of pissed me off. And I remember at the time being pissed off because uh, there was this big old thing, you know, all the religious people coming out and saying, oh, see, that's what happens when you're a porn star. I want to take a moment here for everyone to, to kind of note. When Kurt Cobain died, did they say rock and roll was a bad thing? Did, when Robin Williams died, did they say, oh, acting is a horrible thing to do. You should never do acting or any of these other musicians. Nobody said shit about what they did for a living other than just being a tortured artist. The fact that she was a porn star, now all of a sudden everybody cared, oh, porn is bad, porn is bad. So they just used her as a way to basically put down the porn industry and try to stop it. And to me, that's fucked up, okay? That's, that's like a fucked up, it's usually those fucking fucked up Christians that do that shit trying to push their own agenda. Listen, the girl was depressed or for whatever reason she did it, she's no different than all the thousands upon thousands of other people that commit suicide. It had nothing to do with her porn industry. It, girls do porn all the time. If porn caused suicide, we wouldn't have any naked chicks on the internet anymore. That's just not the way it works. And when people blame video games for kids' behavior and porn for 
boys being rapists and oh, all the bad things and depression and shit. Oh, you know, no, give me a fucking break. Clearly she had some mental issues and that's what they needed to recognize and not just make a fucking political zoo out of it. So that kind of pissed me off. But with Savannah, I am going to put her under no one care because no one actually cared about her suicide itself other than her faithful fans. But the actual media and people like that, they only made they made an example of her to try to attack porn. So now we are on to Bud. OK, now this is our Bud Dwyer. I don't know if any of you remember Robert Bud Dwyer, but here's the story. I'm going to tell you this story. It's a really fucked up story. So apparently Bud Dwyer was a politician and he did some scam shit. He took some bribes or something like that and he got caught. Now, when he got caught, he went through the thing. He was going to be sentenced, uh, uh, completely disgraced. And he was supposed to be sentenced on January 23rd, 1987. So what he does is he has a press conference on January 22nd, 1987, the day before he's supposed to be sentenced. He started handing out packets to everybody, little packets, I guess, maybe uh, commit, uh, uh, telling everybody what he was going to do. And then the last packet he had, he pulled out a huge revolver, held it up, and he tried to say something. But before uh, everyone started screaming at him, telling him no, not to do it. And before anyone could grab him, he shot himself in the head on live television, dropped to the floor, and blood just gushed out of his nose. It, it was like a fucking water faucet. Now, why this is important to me is because I grew up watching Faces of Death, like 17, 18 years old, 16 maybe even. I saw this and I was blown away by it. You know, as you're, when you're a kid, you're kind of fascinated by death. And I watched this over and over again and I was obsessed with Faces of Death. To me, it was just so amazing just watching the blood. And you can still watch this if you want. It's on YouTube. And to me, it was fascinating just watching because, I, you know, obviously you want to see how the human body works and to see the aftermath of that, the, the real thing is just so creepy and it makes you, it, it has this weird euphoric feel to it that you're watching it for the first time and you're like, whoa, that's so fucking creepy. This isn't a, a movie. This isn't Friday the 13th or, uh, you know, it, it's a real fucking thing. And as a side note, okay, being obsessed with faces of death later on in my life around 1994, 95, somewhere around there, I was living in North Hollywood, California. I came across, a, I, had, I hadn't watched the videos in a long time. And I came across a video store that had like four, all like one through four at the time. And I was like, oh fuck, I'm basically, I just watched a whole marathon of fucking faces of death back to back in my room all alone, just watching it. Oh, fuck, 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 fuck. And then at some point I said, okay, I got to get out of here. I'm the, I got to get out of the house. I got to get some fresh air. So I went to go get something to eat. I'm on my way to pick something up in my car, driving along, da, da, da. Of course it's LA. There's traffic everywhere. There's an accident up and up ahead of me. So I'm, I'm caught in the accident. And apparently there was a guy, I don't know, in LA, if you're familiar with Hollywood, there's people on the side of the road selling roses or oranges. And this guy happened to be selling oranges. So apparently somebody hit him and he was laying in the center divider because the car lost control. Whack. He's, you know, he's laying there. I don't know what's going on at the time. I just see a guy laying on the ground, a car uh, off to the side onto the bank. But what struck me as so fucking odd is the paramedics. Now the paramedics, they drove up to there and I swear, these guys were like fucking turtles. Now, there's just a big fucking accident and some poor guy's laying on the fucking ground. You don't know if he's dead or not. You don't know what the fucking situation is. And this paramedic was just like, I'm stuck in traffic. I'm just watching this with amazement. This guy's just strolling along like fucking do, 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 do. And he goes up to the guy and it was the creepiest thing I ever saw. He bends over and grabs the guy's arm to check his pulse. Only he doesn't bend down to... to to be at his level, to check on him. He just bends over, picks up his arm and brings his arm up to him, like almost picking his head and his body up off the ground. He checks his pulse for about 10 seconds and then he just lets go. It was just so creepy seeing him pick this guy up by the arm, pulling his head, his whole, his lifeless body, and then just dropping him and having him just like boom, onto the ground. And I was so freaked out by that. I was like, holy shit, is that guy dead? What? Like at the time I was thinking, what if he's still alive? You know, what the fuck, man? 
So after I got out of traffic, I went back around to go take another look, of course. I, by the time I got there, there was already a sheet over the body. So, and there was no traffic at that time, so I had to keep going. So clearly he was dead. And when you see something like that, it kind of fucks you up. So I went straight home. I think I stayed in my room for at least two weeks straight. I didn't leave because I didn't want to be in a car accident. I didn't want anything bad to happen to me. It freaked me the fuck out. Short little side note with Faces of Death and Bud. Now, Bud will miss him, but he did give an insight into people's state of mind when they commit suicide. And to see that is, I, I don't know, it's mind-blowing to me. No pun intended. So with Bud, we're definitely going to put him under gruesome. There's no other category for him because it was bloody as shit. And so now our last one, last but not least, uh, this one, out of all the celebrity suicides that I've seen over the years, because realistically, you know, I kind of go, oh man, that sucks. I didn't know them personally, so it doesn't really affect me. You know, like, I'm sorry, maybe I'm a cold hearted fucking person, but if I don't know somebody personally, I'm not really going to care. I mean, I care, but I don't care. Like, I'm not going to fucking cry. You know, I barely get emotional over my family. You think I'm going to get emotional over fucking somebody I don't even know? But for some reason, with this person, Anthony Bourdain, that really fucked me up. When I heard about Anthony Bourdain, I was fucking blown away. I was so fucking sad. Well, let me first say that, you know, Anthony Bourdain, again, another hanging. He hung himself on June 8th. 2018 in a hotel in France. He was on location for a shoot for his cable food uh, show, Parts Unknown. He was 61 years old and it's fucking tragic. And the story, the rumor that's out there is that he was dating Asia Argento, uh, an actress, model, something like that. They never actually said, but I think they kind of broke up or had a fight and that's what caused him to do what he did in the heat of the moment. Now, why it affected me is that a year prior to this, I had never heard of Anthony Bourdain. Never, ever, ever, never. So I was looking around on Netflix and he came up uh, an episode of his when he was in Japan and he watched, uh, you know, um, with some sushi chefs and I started watching it. And from there, I was fucking hooked, man. The guy just had a way of making you feel good about yourself. He had a he, he had a way of making you feel like you were right next to him in the restaurant, that you were talking to him, that you were part of his conversation. He was very open about his drug use, his past drug use. He was open about his depression. And from the very beginning, I found it fascinating that he kind of hated being around people. That's the impression that I he even kind of said that, oh, I don't like being here. I don't want to be around these people. And I kept thinking in my head, dude, you're doing a fucking cooking show traveling around the world. Where, what do you think you're going to fucking do? You're going to be around people. But he was for you could tell he was forcing himself to do it to help himself. And that's, I think, hit me the most because that's that's the way I am. I hate being around people. Sometimes I force myself to be around them, but I don't want to be in that situation. But I know it's good for me to be in that situation. But if you watch his show, Parts Unknown, I think he had a couple other cookies. He's been around for a very fucking long time. You will know what I'm talking about. He just had a certain essence to his character, to who he was. He had empathy for everything around him. Yet at the same time, he was kind of cynical and a smart ass and a realist. He was realistic about things. And it was just really sad. And that one, of course, because of that... Anthony goes into the number one tier, the wow, completely unexpected. He's the only one there. He's the only one that deserves to be there for me. Totally blew me away. I can't even watch the show anymore. If it comes on CNN or if it comes on TV or something, I have to turn it off. I can't even watch it because it makes me so fucking sad. He was an amazing person and I feel really bad for his daughter and I feel really bad that he would do that. You know, it, and it would, to me, I was kind of pissed off. I was like, what the fuck, man? Because he seems so fucking... Like he had it together. It was almost like I say to myself, oh, I'll never commit suicide. Fuck that shit. And that's kind of what you would think of him when you watch it. That was my, if I had to think about it, that was my impression that, oh, Anthony would never commit suicide, man. He, he's too fucking cool for that. And then you hear about him doing it. So you're kind of like, whoa, fuck. If he could do it, maybe, maybe it could happen to me. Maybe I could be in that dark place at some point. Celebrity Suicide Tourist. 
That is my celebrity suicide tier list. Did I forget anybody? If I did, if you can think of somebody, leave a comment, let me know about it. Hopefully this is therapy for some people and not triggers for others. So that's our show, plain and simple. Nothing more than our dead-end soul screaming for the torture to go on and on. So we can whisper to ourselves, good job. Good job. May the tragedies we fear today become obsolete in tomorrow's dreams.